and welcome to the She Clicks webinar about flower photography. I'm Angela Nicholson and I'm the founder of She Clicks. Before we get started though, we have a word from our sponsor, uh, which is Datacolor. Datacolor is proud to sponsor this webinar. Head to the Datacolor website to hear more about the latest promotion for Spider X, Datacolor's fastest screen calibrator to date. So thank you very much to Datacolor. Okay, so that's enough from me. It's time to hear from our speaker, Molly Holman, an award-winning flower and garden photographer who is here by popular request. Hi, Molly. Hello, Thank you for everybody. joining us. Thank you. <laughs> it's lovely to see you. So um, have you been out in the garden today? Um, briefly. I'm just recovering from COVID, so I'm not moving very much at the moment. I'm a bit right. coffee. Apologies in advance um, if I'm a bit coffee throughout this evening. But yeah, I've been out a little bit. It's very hot today, so whew, I know. Uh, I'm sure, some people have rain, <laughs> but it's very that would hot. Be nice. Yes, we could do with some of that. Okay, well, I'll I'll leave it to you if you would like to start your presentation. Right. Well, I um, I'm really going to just talk through my processes this evening, and I'm quite happy about sharing my tips and tricks and secrets. And if you've got any questions about what I'm explaining as we're going through, please do ask them, it's never a problem. Um, I'm gonna try and keep it down. I've got quite a lot of slides, so I won't spend too much time on each one. Um, as some of you know, I've um, just had a book published and it all of this is in way more detail if you're interested. And I know many of you have already bought it, so thank you very much. Um, so I came to photography about 15 years ago, although I'd always sort of dabbled. My parents are artists. I loved art and drawing and painting, but when my children were born, I didn't have much time, sadly, to do that. So I picked up a camera to try and sort of document their growing up, really. Um, and I was into everything. And I, as landscapes, portraits, street photography, and it was only really about 2017 when I got heavily into flower photography as a result of winning a camera in an amateur photographer um, competition. And the photo of the butterfly bottom right was one of the first photos that I took with that. And it's a bridge camera. It's a Sony RX10 III, a bit old now, but I still use it. Um, and it just has an enormous zoom. And what it proved to me was that when you are at full zoom with a long lens or such a camera, you can really blur out the background. And that was, as I think as a painter, that was what appealed to me. Um, although I've always tried to get a natural effect, I don't tend to like things that are too over-processed or overdone. So that's where I came from. This is sort of me now. Um, <laughs> you'll find me lying on the floor often or sitting down. Not very good at kneeling, my knees are rubbish. And um, every Friday I go to a local garden and take photographs. And Monday to Thursday, I work as a head of music at a secondary school in Ramsgate. So a bit contrasting, but getting out into nature really, really helps de-stress. Um, and obviously I have quite a busy job regularly. So that has really helped with my um, just just calm me down really and um, I just wander and sit and look and try and slow down I'm quite fast in general and <laughs> I talk quite fast so apologies if I'm if I go rattle through a bit tonight um so the thing that most people ask is about the equipment that I use I have never really been an equipment freak. I tend to try and do everything as cheaply as possible with as little as possible. I hate carrying big bags around. So I will often, for example, take out um, my small, I've got a small Sony mirrorless with a little 50 millimeter lens rather than my macro lens, which is bigger. And then I'll just take an extension, tiny extension tube to go with that. Um, and I think most of what I do, I can do with that. Sometimes I'll take a little LED light, um, especially if I'm out in winter time. Um, and yeah, it, it's, it's as simple as that really. I don't think I need anything more than what I have. Somebody recently gave me a vintage Helios lens and they're about, I don't know, 10 pounds, 20 pounds on eBay. But it, that's been really interesting to play with. I've always loved vintage lenses. I came from a Pentax system prior to my Sony. 
So I had quite a few 60s and 70s sort of uh, manual lenses for Pentax. And you just get just different colours and background effects with these lenses. And I do like to discover new ones. Um, so I thought I should just show you a few of my photos that I have taken with the different lenses that I own. Um, top left is my extension tube just with my regular lens. This kind, I mean, the extension tube is harder to use. You're, it's a lot of rocking in and rocking out to get what the subject of your photo, which in this case is the ladybird sharp. Um, but it does give really good results. You often just have to take more photos. I think the one, the black photo, I probably took about 80 photos of that ladybird to get one. But if I know that it's going to work as a composition, and when I saw it on the black foliage, I, I knew that it would work if I could get it sharp. So it was it was worth the perseverance. Um, still life in the middle. That's just a regular 50 mil lens. The top right, there's nothing done to the background there. It's just blurred out flowers. So that's with the bridge camera at full zoom. Bottom left an old uh, Pentax lens. Middle is my landscape lens, which is a 24 mil. And on the right is my macro lens, which I only bought last year. And it says F2.8 and F10, because that's two photos, one wide open at 2.8 and one at F10, just to capture the middle of the flower. Um, so it's sharp and I wanted the uh, petals to be blurred out. A little bit which is obviously what you would get with the wide open lens. Um, here's a couple with my recently acquired Helios. Um, there are if you're looking at getting one of these try and get the earlier one because it's supposed to be better. I fluked the earlier one because I had no idea until I looked it up but you can see wide open <coughs> far left and far and the one on the right are wide open and it just has this sort of really creamy or even sort of swirly bokke, as in the case of the one on the right and the one in the middle, I just pulled back a little bit on the aperture so that you could see the difference. But it's it's fun and, and manual focus is always fun. I'll talk about that a little bit. It can be frustrating, but it's, it's a good thing, a good trick to learn. Okay, um, composition. These are my sort of key principles. The angle that you are when you take the photo, are you under, are you above, are you level, where you put the, photo, the, the flower in the frame, so do you put it on the rule of third or do you break that rule, I'm quite into breaking rules but it's quite interesting, it's quite important to know them I think to start off with, um, and do you use a portrait ratio or a landscape ratio, so how do you sort of structure that, um, and what's going on in the background. Background is as important, I would say, as the subject of the photo. And I cannot stress that enough. Just one tiny blade of grass in the background can distract your eye from what you're wanting to look at. Usually the point of focus is the center, but not always. So you can play around with that. And I think for me, when I started learning about photography, it, it, it's just experimentation. Do as much as you can. Take photos with your camera on every single aperture, so for every lens, so you can learn which gives you the, the best results or even different results. Um, I think when you are relatively close at the level of the flower, it tends to work best. Um, as a sort of general rule of thumb, if you do one thing, get down to the level of the flower, um, this one on the right is um, I'm holding a diffuser and I'll show you another slide that shows that in a minute but it's just you can see more and you can get background colours I mean the colour there is just provided from other flowers in my garden um, <coughs> when you're choosing a flower to photograph try and not pick one that's got holes in or dust on, you can take a, a, a soft paintbrush with you and uh, maybe just dust it a little bit. So the one, the flower on the left here, it literally was the only one and I wanted to photograph it because I love the background. The background was really creamy, um, but as you can see, rather holy in terms of the, the petals. 
and a little bit of distraction top right here in the background. Now, on this occasion, I did what I could by cloning out those errors, and I would do that in Photoshop. I'll talk about that a little bit later, and I got rid of the background as well. Um, but yeah, if you can find one that's in good condition, I will often spend 10 minutes looking, 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 trying to find which flower has the best position and um, just looks cleanest to start with. Okay, so on the left, this echinacea flower, I, it's probably, it's very high, it's tall, this one, probably up to about my chin. So I didn't really have to move much to take that one. Um, the blue chinodoxia on the right, I was lying on the floor because that flower is, ooh, about two inches tall. And I wanted to see a little bit of the center and the petals and a little bit of context. Um, and again, it's this was uh, probably February or March, the, the blue one and this one on the left, mm, it's quite mm, October, November. And I do go out all year round. And, you know, if I'm a sort of strong believer that any weather condition can work to your advantage, as long as it's not hugely windy, which is obviously very difficult because you, you're dealing with movement. Um, sometimes with garden shots, getting down low can help as well. Um, I do quite a lot of garden landscapes, probably not quite as many as flower portraits, but yeah, getting low, just explore the different angles really that are available to you. Um, I'll sit on the floor for quite a long time, just thinking about what will work best. Um, one of my key tenets is that flowers are faces and coming from portraiture into flower photography, I think this is quite um, an important thing to think about. The flower on the left is looking into the photo and you've got, if you know about negative space, you've got this space there for it to look into just as the girl is on the right hand side. So I wouldn't ever... Um, crop this or even when I'm holding my camera um, use the composition where I would clip it on that side it would feel wrong to me to come in on the right so I like to get the flower to look in to negative space if it's alone as a subject um, and with these ones you can see that all of these flowers are in inverted commas looking into the space the tulip on the left is bent slightly to the left, so it looks in. Uh, the tulip in the middle, which is faded, is looking to the right because of the bend of its stem, and, and so is the uh, drain on the far right. It looks into the picture. And I think just, just gives a pleasing composition for me, really. Um, if you can't discern an angle, as in it, it doesn't seem to be looking left or right, and it's quite upright, I will then often put it bang in the middle um, <coughs> because it just it just works. Sometimes with a bit of space above it, as in the one on the left, um, but it couldn't, I mean, the centre of the magnolia in the middle couldn't be more central, and that, I just wanted the eye to go straight there and then obviously observe the petals folding around the centre. Um, if the flower is quite symmetrical, like daisies um, and so on, you can do it directly down from above as a bird's eye view. Um, osteosperms, as in the flower on the far right, work really well for this. Um, and the water, li uh, water lily in the middle also. So if you have, if you see, okay, that's a circular flower, um, it's good to look down from the above and also you can square crop it quite satisfactorily, so it's quite a balanced shot. Um, I love shooting wide open. The flower on the left is a wide open old vintage Pentax lens and ev almost everything there is blurred, which is kind of quite nice, I like that. Um, if you're doing something um, like an insect, um, you'll need a, a narrower aperture so whilst I was at f1.7 on the left, I would have been at f9 or f10 even with my macro lens for the ladybird because 
for me, if it's an insect, you want to try and get most of that insect sharp and in focus. And I'm sure if you've got a macro lens, you'll know that the depth of field is so shallow with a macro lens, as in it's so easy to get little bits of blur and out of focus. So you want to probably choose a narrower aperture for something like that. Um, manual focus I mentioned earlier, it does take a little bit of, you know, getting the hang of it, but it does mean that you can really choose what you're focusing on. If you let the camera choose, it will sometimes pick a petal nearest to you, which you don't necessarily want. So for this photo, for example, I really wanted to um, focus on the ant climbing the stem, but also that it's kind of because it's lined up with the centre, the centre is in focus as well. Um, if your camera has focus peaking, um, you can actually set it so you can see um, by white light highlights the part of the photo that will be in focus that is in focus. So focus peaking is really useful and um, if your camera has it I strongly suggest turning that setting on so that you can play around with manual focus if you don't already. Sometimes I don't go for the centre as a focus point. So the blue scabies flower on the right, I've got a little bit of petal edge, which isn't very clean actually. <laughs> As I'm looking at it, I can see a little bit of dust here. But um, the flower on the right, there's only a tiny, tiny bit in focus. It's about here. Um, but I love the creaminess that the, um, the really shallow depth of field gives to the background. Um, and I think as a sort of impressionist effect, that's quite nice. Uh, light, really important, especially at this time of year when there's, we've got so much sun in the summer, to think about the direction that the light's coming from and, and what it's doing. Um, so with the tulip on the left, I was shooting in full sunshine. And because of that, you can see that there's this shadow here, which is formed by one of the petals. And it just, again, it, your eye travels to it. Your eye thinks, what is that? And then spend some time working it out. You've also got quite bright highlights here um, that are perhaps avoidable. A little patch of light here, here. And to get around this, you either shoot with cloudy skies or with a diffuser. So in, on this occasion, I was lucky the cloud came over and I took this photo on the right, which has much more even tone and light um, and is generally gonna be more successful most of the time, unless you're using the shadows as, as a part of the composition. So if you can't have cloud, then you need to fake it with a diffuser. And you can see in this photo on the left, there's a diffuser in the photo. I left it in so I could show you. Um, and then even on a bright sunny day, your petals will be even um, in terms of lighting. And it's just, you get to see the beauty of the flower um, without it being distracted by the, the bright sunlight patches. Um, different times of the day, I'm sure you know about the golden hour, um, but different times of the day are definitely worth shooting at. I'm not the best at getting up in the morning at this time of the year, <coughs> but I do like shooting at sunset. So this Rebecca on the left was in my garden. The red behind it was created by a dead conifer tree, which I have since removed, although I almost kept it because it gives quite nice colour. So the sunlight was falling on the conifer, which was dead and red coloured, um, and it gives this real glow to the photo because of the time um, in the evening that it was taken. And similarly in the photo on the right, the grass is behind um, the, um, the banana, the verbena of Manariensis were all sort of glowing in the background. Um, I like shooting in the blue hour. So the blue hour is once the sun has gone down, um, the light takes on quite a diffused blue look and it really does add to some photos, particularly if you've just got 
a little bit of light. I quite like the darker side of things in photography and, and it seems strange when I'm photographing flowers, but I will obviously, I will always jump at doing something like this where I can sort of capture a little bit of dark, the darker side of things. It's, it's quite atmospheric um, and I loved the just the little bit of remaining light in the sky. It really was quite dark at the point where I took this photo. Um, earlier on in the year, sort of March, April or October, November, when the sun is lower, you can actually use it to backlight your flowers, especially if they've got pretty stamens like the one on the right, because then they, they form quite appealing shadows. Um, and sometimes flowers can look really nice when they're lit up. Yes, you still get the shadows that I complained about, but sometimes they're almost symmetrical and it just kind of works. So it's worth a try, um, especially with things that are sort of withered or dying. Hydrangea heads look beautiful when they're dead in the winter, but lit from behind by sunlight, for example. So sometimes you'll just be out at midday and the sun's coming straight down from above as it was in the photo on the left. And I couldn't do anything about it because it's a landscape scene. So I couldn't get any kind of diffuser um, into the scenario. So all I could do with that was to alter it in post-production. So in the edit in Lightroom, I moved my black slider and my shadows slider to the right so that these very dark black shadows here are lifted. Not They're not gone, they'll never go completely, but you can lift them a little bit so that then you can see a bit more detail. <coughs> as a result, you might need to bring your highlights down as a result and possibly your exposure. Um, so it's never perfect shooting conditions midday with the sun directly above, but you can go a, to a certain extent in post-production to, to deal with that. Um, with an LED light, it means I can shoot, I mean, the, uh, in winter, so the photo on the left was in January with these iris reticulata and I just had a little LED light sitting on the floor in that photo in, in, on the left um, and sometimes I'll just attach it to my the top of my camera so with the dahlia bud on the right that that light has meant that these um, droplets just get picked out by the light a little bit more than daylight would give them and this was I was sheltering um, out of the rain and then went straight out when it stopped raining and, and got the one on the right and I'll often look out the window and it'll be raining I think do I really need to go to a garden when it's raining but invariably the rain does stop and you can get such beautiful photos of raindrops on foliage and flower petals and if it does keep raining I'll head to a greenhouse if there is one in the garden um, where I am because you get really lovely diffused light anyway in greenhouses and hot houses so that can be another thing to try. Background, I said earlier it's just so important the background in terms of how you see your subject and if it distracts from your subject and ideally you're looking for it to complement your subject. So I, um, I'm very fond of nigella flowers and I put this one, I clipped it to a stand right in the middle of my garden and then I just walked around it and took um, photos from almost 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, and these are the four resulting photos. Now, I don't, I haven't really decided which one I prefer. I'm sure you'll have favourite, but the point is, if you just move a little bit, you can change your background enormously, um, and it's just so important to think about the background as well as the subject of your photo. I think I quite like this one because the, I, I think there are roses, the creaminess in the background. And I think the roses, they're almost like spotlighting, giving a spotlight effect to the flower there. Um, but yeah, just try and move just one step to the left, one step to the right to see what different backgrounds you can create as a result. All of these were shot with a, quite a long lens to um, that bridge camera to, to blur out the background. Um, I'm sure some of you know the story behind this one. Um, 
was <coughs> lying on the floor, um, photographing upwards at this nigella flower and my son who was wearing a blue t-shirt walked past in the background um, and i slept and it's just amazing really complete coincidence complete fluke that the the colors really worked together sometimes i'll use washing hanging on the washing line to create a background sometimes i'll take a scarf with me um, when i'm going out and about um, obviously being careful not to damage or move anything that you're that, that's around what you're photographing but um, yeah you can get just some brilliant backgrounds all oh, children's toys make nice backgrounds um, I've got a lovely um, lupin photo with a, an orange tent in the background although you'd never know it's a tent because it just glows gently orange so yeah try that out with whatever you've got and if you don't have a garden you can still bring that inside and get the same effects inside the house. Um, speaking of which, I think I did that with this one. Yeah, this was, um, I photographed this in my conservatory and the background is just <laughs> one of the paintings that my one of my boys brought home from primary school. And I don't even remember sadly what the painting had on it, but it gave quite nice color to the background of this flower. Um, <coughs> so yeah I think just be experimental um likewise the Sainsbury's carrier bag which was probably about let me think a couple of meters behind the flower so a long way away um and then sort of big long lens um focusing on the flower and you get quite a nice I don't I'm not a huge fan of such a vivid background like this um, but it just goes to show that if you just try and look at what you've got around you, you can use the most ordinary things sometimes to create good effect. Sometimes I take out of focus photos and use print them and use them as backgrounds. So as you can see <coughs> in the photo on the left, um, where I, I'm pegging flowers because they're my flowers and I've grown them and I do it very carefully so I don't damage, but I would never peg like this in a, in a local garden. Um, the background, I guess, is a metre behind that plant pot. It's just an A3 photo, just printed on my home printer. Um, and then it gives, because it's a similar colour, it gives quite a complementary tone to the subject, to the iris as you can see in the photo on the right. Um, when it's raining hard, I bring everything indoors. So the sweet peas in this photo I cut for my garden and put them on a light pad, as you can see. <coughs> I think that's a screen grab from Amazon or something um, of the uh, light pad picture on the right. Um, and then I added a texture in the edit to that. Um, and it just gives, I just, it's quite a nice effect really, just something a little bit different. So I do use a light pad from time to time. Um, sometimes I just sit in my conservatory and put a background up. No lights, nothing fancy. So if you look at the photo on the left, uh, this is how it started. <laughs> um, you've got one background, I guess that's about A2, and I stuck it on a piece of card. And then another background is creating, is on top of the table. Um, and I wasn't happy with that as a composition. I didn't like that at all. So I ditched the pot. Uh, I think I might have even changed flowers. I can't remember. Then I tried the middle one where I just had a tiny bit of focus on the nearest buds, which was which I quite liked actually. But yeah, exactly the same background. Still in this, I was still sitting in the same chair to take the photo. Um, and then I tried an intentional camera movement shot on the right, which I quite liked. Um, so again, I will always try and get the absolute maximum out of a flower and shoot it so many different ways. Um, and this one session, I'll have probably taken 200 photos, something like that. Um, but I get much quicker at, when I take them into Lightroom, I'll, I'll mark them all out of five before I do anything else. Dun, 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 and then just go back to the fives and the fours and edit some of those. Um, you, you get faster at doing things. 
Um, lighting wise, as I've said at the bottom, if you sit with your back to the window, then you'll use the natural daylight. And as long as it's a reasonably bright day with no sunshine coming through the window onto your subject, that will work really effectively if you've got nothing else at home. Um, if you want to get one thing, I would recommend a light box, as you can see on the left. Um, <coughs> you can get these quite easily from Amazon and other such places. Um, about 30 pounds, maybe something, 40, 30, 40 pounds, but just such a terrific investment. My one stays up almost permanently. And you can see I've got a little mini clamp. These are called third hands um, to hold the flower. And I've got an LED underneath just lighting the petals. And one of my own photos, again, printed out using that as a background. Um, you probably worked out that the flower, the narcissus on the right is not the same flower, but it was taken in exactly the same way. Um, I think in this one, in the edit, I um, added um, a grad, um, a light grad filter coming from the top left um, to give the impression of sun. Yeah, I have many hours of fun with my light box. You can see there's a wire coming up here and basically it gives you, there's a, what you can't see underneath the top is a, an LED strip light. So it does give you some um, control over the light as well. Color, um, it's very important, but <laughs> I've watched many other photographers talking about colour wheels and so on and so on. I have to say, hand on heart, nature usually gets it right. You don't often get big clashes in nature. So whilst, yes, it's nice to know how the colour wheel works and that opposing colours such as blue and orange will always complement each other, actually just go out and shoot and you'll get some great combinations regardless. I'm sure you will. Everything goes with green. <laughs> Um, I do love to do a whole uh, frame of one colour. I, uh, it's quite it's quite impactful, I think. So this one, yes, there are. You can see the shapes of other lichenous flowers in the background, but I think there's an out of focus um, photo of the same flowers used as an overlay on this one as well, which is something that I do in Photoshop. Black and white. I do love black and white. Um, I don't do it hugely, purely because photo, uh, flowers, if they're colourful, really usually work better in colour. Um, and a lot of people get hugely into black and white and try and convert everything to black and white, and it doesn't often work. What usually does work is white or yellow flowers with a contrasting background. Um, and although this one has a texture, behind it you get the general idea that the flower itself is bright and the background is white and therefore there's some good contrast i think if you just think black and white is what you're after there should be some strong white and some strong black and then you'll get a good contrast um, i love the white edges to these leaves of the sempervirum flower on the left that just it for me it just gave such good structure um, if rather than black and white the resulting photo is just greys, I don't think it works as well. So I think if you want to create a good black and white photo, really seek out sort of the opposite ends of the spectrum for good contrast. And I cannot, I cannot possibly argue for the grey version here <laughs> over the sort of such striking pink one on the left. So do try it, um, but just try and look for things that will work. You can even set your camera to black and white in the first place, um, which is a nice, fun little challenge. Shooting through, I love shooting through. Um, it's when you push your lens up against things in the foreground. So this dahlia on the left, was there was only a really a tiny hole between a group of dahlias in the foreground and I pushed my lens there so that part of the dahlia is in focus and then you get this sort of haze of colour which I love and I do as much as I can. There's very little post-processing here other than some brightening um, and the same with the agapanthus bud here. The This purple is just out of focus agapanthus flowers 
in the foreground. I think both of these were taken with a long lens and that really does help again to get this blurred effect. Um, insects, <coughs> um, I love shooting insects. I'm hugely into it now, particularly this year. I'm trying to grow things in my garden to attract particular butterflies and beetles. Um, and I think it's something that I will do a lot more of in the future. Um, I'm all about pollinators and protecting them. And it's something that I feel that I can make, you know, if I can raise the profile of these creatures, then that's a good thing. So I'm definitely going to be doing more of this. Um, and I just think it's, again, it's getting to the level of, of the insect that you're photographing and just using it in the frame as part of the composition. I do love to have context. I very rarely shoot sort of such macro shots that I need to focus stack. I'm not, uh, focus stacking is something that I don't do really because I, I don't, I just want to get the creature in context with, surrounded by its, in, its natural environment. Um, I thought you might be interested to see, it's a sort of a workflow, a bit brief. Far left, um, I shoot in raw because then I, if I have bright highlights or shadows, I can control them a little bit more. So I've pulled the photo into Lightroom in the middle and added a little bit of colour and a bit of exposure, probably a bit of contrast. Um, and um, then taken it into Photoshop and used an out of focus photo as an overlay just to give a little bit of uh, well, it's a, a brighter, more interesting, more colourful background. Um, so it's a slightly more complicated process than one, two, three, but I could do all of these steps probably now in about eight, ten minutes. Um, and it's worth it if you've got a beautiful flower like this pin. I will happily spend 45 minutes on an edit if I know that it's going to look good and, and work in the end. However, I do love to challenge myself with straight out of camera. So sometimes I'll put my camera on JPEG and choose my light carefully. Um, and all of these three are straight, not edited at all, straight out of camera. Um, the middle one, there are cobwebs you can see here, little bits of dust. So I could have actually sorted some of that out before I took the photo, but it's always a learning curve. Um, and I love getting good at things that I find difficult. I find shooting straight out of camera quite difficult. So I make myself do it more um, to get better at it. Um, this is a typical Lightroom edit. If you want to see my slider settings, they are in my book, um, but do ask questions. So I'll crop first. Um, then usually add contrast, lift shadows a bit and add a little bit of clarity. I will use vibrancy and rarely saturation. Um, I tend not to use saturation with flowers because it just makes them look slightly artificial. <coughs> um, then I'll sometimes denoise if it looks a little bit grainy in the background. Um, and then a hint, a hint of a vignette at the end usually. Um, my rule with vignettes is if you can see that they're there, then they're used a little bit too much. So it just brings, but it just brings the focus to the flower a little bit. Um, okay, Photoshop. Uh, I usually only use it to get rid of things that are distracting in the background. So in the photo on the left, I've taken out these iris petals from a neighboring flower. Um, and I have, I think, added uh, um, an, an out of focus um, overlay just to give it a little bit of light. Um, you can do, if it's small dirt specks, I will use spot healing. And if it's large petals like this, I'll use the content aware fill tool. Um, I'm fully aware that I haven't, I'm not explaining what these things are, um, but you can easily go to YouTube or to Google um, and look them up and it will explain. I'm a big fan of very brief YouTube tutorials and I've learned myself so much that way. Um, I 
find that sometimes when a background's quite dark, I can add a little bit of light or a little bit of interest to it by using one of my own um, out of focus photos again. So I just thought you'd like to see the one on the left and how I've used it as a background, just to give a hint of something a little bit more um, similar in tone to the subject, of, which is the peony. Um, so it's never used at full opacity, and my opacity is usually about 40 or 50 percent. Um, but I do spend quite a lot of time making these out of focus photos so that I can then use them on flowers with similar colours that I might shoot in the future. Um, this one was outdoors, but I put a piece of, had a lot of distracting um, foliage in the background, so I put a piece of white card behind the flower, photographed the flower, and then added an out of focus overlay, um, which has a real sunset feel on it. I felt that it really complemented the, the uh, flower colours. Um, big fan of apps. Um, I've listed some here. These are the ones that I use more than anything else. Um, picture this is my plant identification app and it is, you do pay for it, but it's so worth it to, to uh, obviously I have to know what I'm photographing and it's, <laughs> it's quite a struggle learning all the Latin names, but I'm getting there. Um, and again, it's a challenge. I do like a challenge. Um, the Photographer's Ephemeris, I think it's got a different name now. I think it might be called Sunset Sunrise, but it basically tells you where the sun is going to be in the sky at what time, what time it sets. So you can really plan if you're doing a trip out where to be at any particular time. Um, butterflies, bird net, weather app. And if you don't have Snapseed, um, sorry, if you don't have Lightroom or Photoshop, as I'm sure many of you don't, Snapseed is my go-to app, um, which is free and you can use it on a tablet or on a phone and it does great things. You can even clone out parts of the background that you don't want to be there. So I'm a big fan of Snapseed and um, as I've said earlier, I'm a big fan of doing things as cheaply as possible. So if you don't quite want to make the jump to Lightroom or Photoshop, definitely try Snapseed because it's, it's just brilliant. It takes a while to get used to it and to learn it, but um, the results can be excellent. Um, I'm a huge fan of learning, learning, looking, looking, and getting inspiration from everywhere I can, really, um, including going to art galleries, reading books, not necessarily about photography, but, you know, just absorbing different ideas about different subjects and even different um, genres of photography can all play into the way you see things in the world. So um, I definitely say absorb as much as you can. I use Instagram more than anything else probably to just look at just amazing photography. And if you build up a, a really good list of people to follow, then it's, it's just like reading an amazing photography book on a daily basis. You can see um, what these people are doing. So I've just listed some here um, of my influences. Um, Close Up Photographer of the Year is a definite to follow because you just get just people from around the world creating stunning photos. Um, so all of those people. Um, and if you're thinking about going to local gardens more, just email them and ask them, can I go before the public come? And they will usually say yes, especially if you say, well, I'll give you some of my photos in return. So I'm a bit, you know, I do live in luxury slightly that I usually go to gardens when there's no one there. <coughs> so I have such peace and quiet. And um, it just, you know, you can just get lost in nature and it's fantastic. So don't be frightened to email a local garden and say, can I go out of hours? Can I go at sunset? I will send you some photos um, because you might be surprised and they might say yes. Thank you very much. I hope I've been a little bit relevant and useful. I have my final slide is my plug, which is the book that I have just published. And thank you, as I said earlier, to everyone who's already bought it.
it's actually so cheap on Amazon at the moment. Amazon are doing such a good deal on it that I can't even with the ones that I buy directly from the publisher, I cannot match the price. But I do, if you're if you would like a signed copy, I can sell, um, I can send you one and all the details are on my website, which is here, Molly Holman at my portfolio.com. And I also sell some of my overlays, my out of focus photos there as well. So thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so first question, well, actually, before we get started, there were quite a few questions, people asking you about your editing process. I know you and using textures and layers. I mean, that could be a whole webinar in itself. And indeed, people are saying, oh, could you do a webinar about that? But I just, <laughs> I just wondered if you could maybe just explain in very broad terms what applying a texture or an overlay does or how you do it. Um. Yeah, I, it work really if the background is reasonably plain um, and you can just open your flower photo in Photoshop and then from wherever you're keeping your out of focus over, I call them overlays because they're not really textures in the original sense. I know a lot of people use the word texture, which is fine, um, but I, I will bring on, just drag an overlay on top. The subject will disappear and then you go to your opacity slider on the right and move it down to about 40% and you'll begin to see your subject again. And then you can just paint off um, the area of the flower that you want to see and leave the rest blurred out. And it is quite difficult, without showing you, it's quite difficult to explain how to do it, but there is very much a step-by-step -step, um, process in the book. And you can, I'm sure, go to YouTube and look up how to add a texture to a photo. And I'm sure many photographers will show you how to do that. Yeah. OK, thank you for that. And indeed, we do <coughs> actually have a couple of webinars on the SheClicks YouTube channel. Um, so if you want to look that up, it's uh, YouTube forward slash SheClicks. Uh, we have a few webinars about um, editing and using textures. So maybe look for those as well. OK, so uh, first question. Uh, someone's asking which camera do you use because obviously if you're using full frame or APS-C format those focal lengths that you were talking about have... sure um yes I was originally using a Pentax system which was APS-C then I switched to mirrorless thinking on oh, getting on a bit I could do with a lighter camera um and of course mirrorless usually are lighter but the lenses that go with them aren't necessarily um, so I have chosen quite light lenses. I use a Sony A7 III um, is my main camera. And that's Although, full frame. Uh, yes, which is full frame. Although I use uh, the bridge camera that I was talking about earlier almost as much, I have to say, even though it's quite old. Um, and it, the sense is quite good, actually. It's not as good in low light. Um, but you can compensate for that if you know that. Um, and yeah, so the Sony a7 III is my main camera. Okay, thank you. Um, now someone says that they enjoy using vintage lenses on the Fuji X-T4 um, and she uses an adapter for that. Would an extension tube work with a, uh, a vintage lens with an adapter? Yeah, <laughs> yes. And I was doing this uh, yesterday, actually. I'd got, so this Helios lens that, that was given to me, I, I try, I've put, you put your adapter on first, then you put your extension tube or more on, and then it's, it's fine. It should be, it's fine for me, and I'm fairly sure that it should be fine for other systems. Okay, thank you. Now we have a couple of questions kind of relating to Helios and Lens Baby. So the first one is, um, is Helios similar to a Lens Baby? Yes, I nearly mentioned that. I should have mentioned that earlier. I've never... Um, I've never had Lens Baby lenses, not because I don't want to, I would love to, I will snap one up if I see one second hand, um, but the Helios I think are very similar, they have the same sort of swirly bokeh, um, and you can do all sorts of things with vintage lenses, you can, you can even reverse turn them completely around and sort of shoot through them, which is another nice way of getting some beautiful effects, um, but for everything, for, for all of these vintage lenses, um, again, try YouTube for people showing you what the things that you can do with them. Sometimes um, with the Helios, it, which is the same as I think as what I've heard people say about the lens baby, it can be very hard to get even a single point of sharpness. So it's, it can be me meaning that you'll take lots and maybe just get one where you've got one point of focus. 
or maybe you don't want any point of focus, which we, again, which is fine. Um, but yeah, it, it can be harder. It's the whole manual focus thing that, that it's difficult sometimes, but practice. Yeah, yeah. And especially if you've got something moving, it's very tricky. But yes. um, And the, the other lens baby question was, do you ever use one? But you've answered that because you don't have one. So <laughs> it's okay. Um, now, another question uh, about extension tubes. Do they work with zoom lenses? Um, I don't know. I'm just trying to think if I've ever used, I've only, I've only mainly ever had primes. I don't see why not, but I may have to defer to Google on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, went to, I went to exactly the same thing. I was trying to think whether I'd ever done it. I think I have, but a long, long time ago, so long ago, I'm not sure. But as you say, I don't think there's any reason why they shouldn't, because the yes. way they work is basically mm. just move the lens further away from yes. the camera so it can focus more closely. And so it it, it should work. But obviously, uh, as you zoom, um, the, fo the, sh the focus distance that you get may change um, as it would, even if you didn't have the extension tube. So. Yes. Possibly, probably is the answer there. Um, right, someone is asking, do you always photograph in situ or do you ever pick a flower and then choose a suitable background? Oh, um, yes. Um, I'm just trying to think probably more in situ, but I sometimes just can't resist going to a florist in December. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just so thoroughly depressed with what's outside um, and I'll bring the flowers home and then I'll use my own yeah definitely use my own backgrounds inside okay and um thinking about you mentioned using diffusers someone was asking you know how do you place them and how do you hold them so I'm glad someone asked that because I'm I have my diffuser here which I brought to the talk um this is a small one you can get bigger ones um, and I can't quite stretch fully out because I'll go into my computer, but I'll hold the diffuser with my left hand and my camera with my right hand. This isn't always easy because cameras and lenses can be quite heavy, in which case at that point I'd probably use a tripod. I don't often take tripods out to gardens. Sometimes I do if I think I'm going to do a lot of insects, but if I can get away with not taking a tripod, I will do. So I'll hold the diffuser with one hand and then the camera with the other hand. Um, I have a Wimberley plump, so, um, which is a, a stretchy arm. So sometimes I'll clip one end of that to me and the other end to the diffuser. So then I can use both hands to hold the camera. That's quite nice. Um, but it, it's trial and error, error. When I'm in my own garden, I just have a, a light stand with a clip on the top and I can pick my own flowers, put them in the clip, and then I can rig this um, diffuser with a tripod or another stand. So I've got a whole set up in my garden um, where I can pick my own flowers. And I, I grow my own flowers a lot more to photograph these days than I used to. So I do spend a quite a lot of time gardening actually. Okay. And did you say that that's the smallest diffuser that you've got? Have you got a big, bigger one as well? Um, yes. Well, if you go to eBay or um, a sort of a camera shop or Amazon, they're often ooh, probably about a meter across. I yeah. suppose usually they're intended for portraiture. So if you go outside again, and I, I will use them in portrait shoots, so to, to take the sun off the face of um, the person that you're photographing, so that they don't have harsh shadows. So yeah, the the more standard ones are much bigger but they yeah. often still have handles so you can still hold them or clip yeah. them to a tripod yeah you can say a hand, handle is a really useful thing because sometimes they're just a, a ring that's it that yeah. can be a bit awkward to hold yes. <laughs> um, but I, I guess also actually because you're photographing quite closely you know if when you have a big diffuser you don't you don't, you don't need quite such a big diffuser when you're close because you would hold yes. it quite close yes. to your that's subject. It. yes yes okay. So that's handy. Now, spookily, you you start you kind of touched on this because someone said when you're shooting macro, do you handhold or use a small tripod? I don't think I ever. I have two small tripods, and I think I only ever use them if I'm literally on the ground. So you know, like you'd have a beanbag on the ground, or mm -hmm. yeah, I sometimes use them for that because they are lighter than my beanbag, um, <laughs> and it's all about keeping the weight down for me. Um, so yes, sometimes I'll use, I, I tend to find that tripods slow me down and don't give me the flexibility to move to get a good background. So I do use tripods 
rarely, but if I know, for example, when I was talking about my garden setup, I have one flower, then I'll bring everything, I'll bring the equipment to that flower. Yeah. Okay. I know exactly what you mean. You, you get, sometimes you get exactly the right composition left and right, but then you want to tip it down and then you want to go up a bit and then down a bit. And it just yeah. seems like you're, mm -hmm. mo you're spending more time yeah. adjusting your tripod. <coughs> Um, right. Oh, you've already said that you grow your own flowers to photograph. Um, are there any LED, LED lights that you would recommend? Um, no, um, I, <laughs> I really am Mrs. Generic. I have to say I tend to get something cheap and cheerful as long as it's got some good reviews. I'm happy with that. Um, I know that you can get really, I do have one that I bought more recently, which you can get different colours within the LEDs. So they turn, so you can get more of a yellow hue or more of a blue hue. But to be honest, I tend not to use them because if you put a blue hue on a flower, it tends to stop looking like that flower and look, looks a little bit more artificial. So whilst those things are great for portrait sort of model shooting, I think perhaps less so. So just a standard LED, really. Um, yep. The only thing I would say is get one if you can that you can plug into a USB to charge. If you have to put batteries in it um, and you're like me and you forget to turn it off, you go through too many batteries to make it economically <laughs> worthwhile. <laughs> so USB charge ones are <laughs> much easier. Good plan. I was just looking around because I know I've got a little square LED and I can't remember the 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 make of it i think it's uh i think it's a joby actually um they do some little ones and also uh manfrotto makes some which yes good. Right. yes okay in the landscape picture with the dark shadows where he talks about moving the black slider to bring up the shadows uh, yeah. this person says is it always better to use the black slider than the shadow slider and what's the difference between those two sliders i start with the shadows and if i can do it with just the shadow slider I will do that because you get um, a more realistic look with just the shadow slider. If I need to, then I'll go to the blacks as well, but it starts to change the whole coloration of the photo if you do that. So then you might have to bring the other sliders into play to balance that, for example. So if I can get away with just using um, shadows, slider then I will do and I rarely touch that blacks one I have to say unless it is a photo like that where it is where the shadows are really harsh I try not to use the blacks just because it is so um it it, it stops looking real when you get to a certain point okay um and when you were talking <coughs> about print, printing your own backgrounds do you use matte paper um no I use photographic paper not, I probably wouldn't, I'd say luster more than, it wouldn't be gloss because that, that would give sort of reflections. In fact, I can't even remember what I do use. Um, if I've got, I don't print my own photographs when I sell them. I tend to um, get, uh, use an online company, printing company. Mm -hmm. So if I'm putting an order in, then I'll use, um, I'll put some of those overlays out, focus overlays into that order. But when I print my own ones, um, yeah, I just, it, it's usually matte. It wouldn't be A4, but it would be like matte or lust, luster, preferably. Okay. And someone was asking, what's your favourite home printer? Because they seem to have been through quite a few. <laughs> I just have, I just have a Canon Pixma. But as I said, I don't print my, if I'm selling it, I'll, I'll just get it printed professionally. Okay. Um, that's an interesting question. What do you do with all the images uh, that you take? Ah, oh, that's a great question. I, um, the ones that I like, I put on my website. Um, and for me, knowing when I started doing this, it wasn't so that other people could see them. It was so that I could see them as a collection and just think, you know what, actually, I have taken some photos that I quite like. So I think that's really important to actually have a place where you put all your photos that you're proud of, that you can go to when you're having a, you know, your mojo's gone, which happens to all of us. And you can just look and think, actually, you know what, that was nice. And I like that one. And that's got a good composition. So I think that's really important. So I put them all on my website. And then sometimes I go to that and prune it a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's, I just think it's so important or print them, print your favorites and put them on, on your walls, even if it's in your bathroom walls, just, you know, so that you can see them and 
feel proud that you've taken them really I think that's a really good point it's really important to celebrate your own photography mm. Mm. yes um oh it's a nice observation here someone says asked if you um study the botanical backgrounds of flowers because your images would suggest that you do um yes I have a couple of books on botany and again, I'm I'm learning here, but I like learning. <laughs> so yeah, I do I do study the parts of flowers um, and their anatomy and how they function, and particularly really how they grow, so that I know peak times to get what I want and what to find and when I'll find it. And I read up on the insects that I want to attract and what flowers to grow to attract them and so on. Um, when using a light pad, how do you reduce the flowers being I think how do you prevent the flowers from being silhouetted? Do you right. use a Sorry. really good question? I do use an LED light usually attached to the camera. And when I am using a light pad, I'll usually be standing right over the top of it. So the light pad will be on the floor or in a chair. Um, and an LED light on the um um, on the camera pointing down. This can sometimes then reflect on the light pad. So sometimes I'll have to clone out little bits of light reflection on the light on the photo that the um, LED light has created. Um, but you can do that quite easily in Photoshop and it doesn't take long. Um, but sometimes it's just about getting the right angle so that you don't get big reflections. But yes, you do have to, I think something like an LED light to create um, light on this, on your side of the flower, as well as light from behind the flower. Great, thank you. I'm just scrolling down the <coughs> questions and I can see some people have very kindly commented that they have used extension tubes with various zoom lenses. So that's, Brilliant. that's a five answer for you. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you for answering that one. Um, oh, someone's saying out of curiosity, do you ever want to skip denoise? Does it sometimes give undesirable effects? Do I want to skip, sorry, say that again? Denoise. Oh, um, if I, yeah, if I don't need to use it, I won't use it. It's um, sometimes at low light, you do get quite a lot of noisy background. So then I'll use it. I do also have a denoise, um, piece of denoise software, Topaz denoise, which I will use. Sometimes for if I'm entering into a competition, I'll, I'll take it through that just so I know that there's, it, it's clean. But if you use it too much, it can really start to, to destroy the detail. So you have to use it very carefully. Um, so I, I read up about sort of optimal settings for that really before I started using it in Lightroom. Okay, thank you. And how do you store your photos? Um, okay, on a, a vast array of external hard drives and each external hard drive is also backed up on another external. So I have one very big one that backs up all the others, basically. Um, but I do keep things in the cloud. Another bonus of the website is that obviously you're, you can store your best photos in the cloud so you know they're protected. Um, and I should say, actually, because I have the Lightroom and Photoshop Adobe package, it's the photography package, you do get five free websites with that. Um, so I watched a couple of YouTube videos on how to set that up and then I set it up and I've never looked back and it's it's just brilliant free website and um, it stores a lot of photos at quite a high resolution actually it's not too slow um, I have I also use Google Drive Amazon Cloud all the other extra bits but yeah mainly on external hard drives okay thank you um Oh, this is an interesting. How do you choose which images to enter uh, into competitions? Do you have a sense of what will do well? Good question. Um, so I try not to follow trends. I think that's quite important. I try and go with my own instinct. Um, sometimes that can result in um, you not particularly doing being very successful. Sometimes it can be the opposite. So I think I think you just have to to shoot for yourself really I think it does depend on the competition so some of the competitions I do just want perfect flower portraits with clean backgrounds really impactful color um, so you if you look back on their website at previous successful um, 
entries, then you can get a feel over time, I think, um, for what will work. Some photos, like a wildlife photographer of the year, you have to, a context is good. So they'll like grasses in the background um, and you're not allowed to edit much at all. So it, again, each one of these gives its own challenge. And I love that in terms of that I'm learning how to do different things with, for different aspects. I'm not all about competitions, um, but it's, I, I kind of like the challenge. <laughs> I'm quite competitive in that sense. Um, and I like learning how to do things for a particular end, which is why I've done quite a few in the past. But I do remember entering them or oh, years and years and years ago and thinking, hey, I've taken these great photos and that, that they haven't been shortlisted and why? And then obviously a few years down the line, you know why. <laughs> and I think I know why now. So yeah. um, you just you just get a feel for it. Yeah. And I think sometimes um, I've judged a few competitions and you'll see an image which is clearly inspired by um, the previous year's winner. And, yes. you know, as, it's great to be inspired and to try and tackle things. But obviously, if it looks very similar to last year's winner, it, it mm. can't win. No. So no. it's, it's you know, it's, it's interesting, like you say. So if you that, and a winner can set trends because everybody wants yes. to try it. Yeah. But you can't yeah. if you stick with that trend, you won't win. So the, the winning photo this year in um, International Garden Photographer of the Year competition was a butterfly um, with a very vivid blue uh, background and the butterfly had a sort of similar hue and it's not at all naturalistic it is mm. beautiful but it's not my style um, and I I was not I'm not going to change how I shoot and edit to be like that I'll just keep doing my thing yeah. and my tastes change as I learn and as I grow and so as as everybody's do really so we shall see <laughs> So um, an observation from someone on, on Facebook is that instead of a diffuser, you can use a white umbrella. Yes. Which is a really useful tip. Yes. Yeah. Uh, another question. Do you ever shoot infrared? Oh, you know what? I was thinking the other day, I really need to get one of my old cameras adapted for infrared. Um, very rarely. Um, I have played around with infrared in, in uh, the editing stage because there are some presets that give infrared effect never as good as the real thing i love infrared stuff that's definitely a plan for the future but um not much <laughs> okay thank you we have a couple of questions about light boxes firstly um somebody's asking how do you avoid a color cast with a light box and secondly would you recommend a particular light box um i've never had um a particular i've never had a color cast issue the led lights are white um, I've never had a problem with that. Um, in terms of me recommending, um, I'm very happy to put the one that I have in the Facebook comments later. Um, but again, I just went to Amazon and read the reviews and chose the one that was in my price range um, and, and went with that. It's about, I say the only thing to look for is, to, my hands are out shot, <laughs> is, to, <laughs> is to get one that's at least 30 by 30. Some of them can look huge in the, in the um, pictures and then they, they arrive and they're <laughs> tiny. I've heard stories yes. of that happening. <laughs> um, so yeah, make sure you read the dimensions and try and get one with an LED strip. But other than that, I think, you know, anything's fine. <laughs> okay. Do you put your cop a copyright mark on your photos? And what are your thoughts on doing that? Okay. And you've probably seen it pop up on, the, on a couple of the photos in this presentation because I dragged them in from somewhere where I had done that. Okay, yes, when I put them on Instagram, I have a really faint um, watermark. I don't like them. They distract. But a couple of years ago, I had somebody taking my photos and entering them <laughs> into competitions. So at that point, I thought, right, okay, I do, I do need to do something about this. Having said that, it's quite easy to clone out a watermark. So you know that you'll never, but hopefully you'll just make somebody have a second thought about using it if it's got your watermark on it. But yeah, they can be a little bit intrusive. Yeah. Mine's quite near the bottom and it's very opaque. Um, so uh, it's as faint as it can be, but it is yeah. there when I put them on Instagram. I must say, actually, when judging Im uh, images for a competition, when it's got a watermark on it, oh. it, it's really distracting because you keep looking at the watermark and it's really hard to assess the image. Yeah. 
yeah, without yeah. it. And I sometimes end up putting my hand over it. Well, I'm sh I mean, most competitions wouldn't eat. That would be disqualified, mm. I think, before you've even yeah. got anywhere. Because, yeah. Yeah, as you say, it, it's not anonymous and it's distracting. OK. Um, oh, and another point they were saying about they, some uh, friends are saying that this person should sell photos or make cards to sell. And I think that's when you're making cards, I think actually that really is when you don't want watermarks on them. But you, you yes. could put something yes. on the back of the card. Yes. Yes, I would never do that on a card. People don't want that if they're giving it to somebody. Um, I do sell cards a lot. Um, these days I hand make them. Um, sometimes I get them printed. It's hard if you get them printed to keep the cost down, basically. So I, the cheapest I can get professionally printed is about 65p, which includes the envelope and a cellophane bag. Um, for a five by seven card so I do do that sometimes but then you still have to fold them and then put them with the envelope in the cellophane bag so normally I will just glue my own professionally printed photos to blanks and then put them with an envelope in a cellophane bag that way uh, but yeah it's lovely it's a lovely thing to do making cards and you always have an unlimited supply <laughs> for birthdays and you never run out of cards <laughs> like, I'm going to anticipate the question, where do you get the cards printed for 65p? Um, six print. Six print. Is, okay. is one of the companies that I've used. There's another one in the west of England called Penny Batch. Um, they're the two companies that I have used um, and liked, actually. That you never quite get with a with a printed greetings card you never quite get the vivid color that a photo will give you which is why i've gone back to the slightly more labor intensive making my own and i have i had a, a stamp made for the back i used to use little stickers but now i have a little stamp and it just says handmade by molly and it's just it works it works fine yeah. um it's still labor intensive but it's a lovely thing to do yeah sounds nice um uh, going back to the uh, image you had of the Rebecca uh, with the dead conifer in the background. Um, someone's <laughs> asking, what aperture did you use for that, please? Um, right. So I know that that was my bridge camera. So it would be at full zoom to blur out the background, which is about 600 millimeters. Although that's, I think it's equivalent to something like 220 because it's not quite, it's from digital zoom. Um, and it would be F4 um for that one because that's the lowest aperture that that camera has um but just it, it yeah i think with a long lens you'll always be you'll always be at quite a, a 5.6 or a 6 aperture because they don't go smaller yeah. but then you don't need them to go any smaller if it's a long lens and you're shooting from far away so i think i think if, if it's any long lens and it's and it's lowest setting it'll be fine yeah okay we've got a nice comment here someone uh, has got a friend visiting the UK for the Commonwealth Games. She lives in Jamaica and they have come and they're picking up your book. <laughs> she's going to say she's looking forward to getting that. So that's nice. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> um, another observation, your images appear so sharp online uh, and they look lovely. What pixel dimensions do you use, for example, along the long edge to achieve the appearance? Um, well, the ones on my website, they will just, I will just not, I will not restrict pixels at all when I export. But I, you know, I am restricted by my cameras. So I think they're both 24 megapixels and so they're not huge. I know you can get much yeah. more than that. And a lot of the inset ones are really cropped in. So some of these inset ones will be probably about one megabyte. So they're not, but then online, it's usually fine. It, it's only yeah. when you try and print, I think that you have more issues if you're trying to print bigger. Yes. The, the, the downside of having it does depend on your website and bandwidth and things like that the downside of having lots of large images images on your website is that the page can take a long time to load yes, very much so yes so you have to keep an eye on that and that's why i do go back and sort of prune it down a bit sometimes i will if it if i know it's an enormous photo i will export it at a smaller pixel dimension um but you know with with the competitions i think they ask they ask for 1920 on the longest side pixels normally, which is fine for which is, you know, for to be viewed yeah. online. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it's something that I would necessarily think about too much unless it was enormous. Yes. I mean, that's that's certainly the size that I request for the She Clicks Challenge. And one of the benefits of that is that you can put 
several images into an email and send them so yes. that you don't have to use we transfer yeah. and things like that and they're uh, still sharp they're still you know they're, they're great they're oh, good they look good uh, someone is saying that the helios 44.2 has become very popular and now cost as much as 80 pounds Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> um gosh i don't know um i looked when did i look in may and i found three for a tenner but i don't know what quality they were and i don't know what kind they were so yeah i guess things go in and out of fashion um I'm yeah I I really lucked out with that because I I didn't expect it but it was a colleague at work and she said my grandfather's left me his camera and his lens and I don't know what to do with it so I took her a, a, a bluebell photo as that was her favorite flower and put it in a frame and gave it to her as a, a nice little gift for her giving me the lens so oh, lovely. lovely that's nice that's nice uh right oh someone has recommended a website shuttermuse Shutter, oh i can't speak shuttermuse.com ultimate guide to extension tubes um to find out everything you need to know about extension tubes so i imagine if you if you google that it'll pop up uh right someone has said she's getting on in years and find her back gets sore when she's hunched over shooting macro she sometimes yeah. brings a tiny stool any recommendations on how to get low but prevent your back or knees getting sore well this is it isn't it i when i'm in a garden i will sit down i literally sit on the floor i my, i just find that i can't kneel for any length of time um but then if you sit on the floor it can take a while to get back up again so i really need to invest in some yoga classes i think um i don't know i think if i mean it will happen to me i'm sure so i'll, I'll I, I i guess i'll take more flowers inside so that i can put them in a level in a tripod at a level that is convenient for me to sit up and when i'm working at the table as you saw in the photo in the presentation the tables that are fine you know it's a perfect height for me to sit at and i'm not having to crouch down i would say that make sure your tripod is one that goes up high enough for you not to have to stoop down over it and if you're using a light box lift that right up to the point where again you don't have to crouch to see into it okay i would say i obviously it depends on the height of the plant but i i tend to lie down quite a lot mm. because then you're not hunched are you yes. um but obviously yeah. sometimes you, you might want to carry a bin bag or or not worry yes. about your clothes whatever bin bags are great yeah um i always go out with something like that and i always wear quite old clothes anyway i have ski trousers <laughs> for, for the winter <laughs> because it doesn't matter if they get dirty i do always get people asking me if i'm okay when i'm like <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah we have a lot of meetups at she click with she clicks at uh, rhs wisley and oh, yeah. there's always people lying around and being asked <laughs> if they're okay <laughs> quite funny just brilliant um someone is asking what was the name of the stretch arm that you mentioned i think that was the wimberley Wimberley Plump, odd name, but very, very useful. It's not as cheap as it used to be, sadly, anymore, but very effective, really brilliant. Couldn't do without that. Okay. Uh, someone has popped in recommending a newer LED from Amazon. Yes, I've used uh, some newer things before, they're good. And, th and someone else has used uh, Godox uh, Lightman's LED. She said it's fab. So that's handy to know uh have you ever done any avs of your using your photos not really i have a drone um now so i'm doing some drone videos um in local gardens i <laughs> i'm not a huge fan as a, of, a, of drones if i'm not using them because they <laughs> if you're sitting in a garden you hear one or see it above you it, it's highly irritating so when i do take a drone to a garden like it's always when the public aren't there it's always out of hours and i always get permission but yeah so i'm starting to do a little bit of video that way i kind of uh, yeah i do think i should do more actually just little clips even if it's just for instagram but i just forget i just get excited by the photographic scenario in front of me and forget to turn it onto video <laughs> Fair enough. Um, oh, someone was saying how much asking how much your light box cost box costs because they um, looked on Amazon and they found anything around oh is it, they've said 30 inches is nearly a hundred pounds, but I think you, you meant 30 centimeters, didn't you? Yes, did I say inches? I think I think you just <laughs> I said blame the COVID brain. I don't know. <laughs> but yes, yeah, 30 cents about this big. <laughs> 
so 30 uh, pound price range they said they, they're only about 12 inches which is 30 centimeters so yeah that's fine there you go yeah, that's fine you I'll, go. I'll, I'll i will find the link and i'll put it in the comments thank you uh someone said did they did they hear you right when you said if you subscribe to lightroom or fo and photoshop so you have the adobe photographers package do you get free websites yes you get five um i oh, use one for my main website and i use the other ones for clients uh, in fact i use one for the book that i'm writing next to sort of keep everything there but those those are only private unless i tell people about them um so again you can set a password or you can leave it open you can set it so that people can download the photos or you can set it so they can't um, but they're very clean looking, um, the Adobe ones, and you can choose the style and so on. It takes a little bit to learn how to set it up, but I'm very, very pleased I did. Great. That's really good. Uh, right. Uh, a good question here. How do you keep your images so sharp when you don't use a tripod? Um, I don't know, really. Um, just trial and error, I, I guess. You get better at doing it over time. I think when you're shooting with a longer lens, obviously more of the subject is going to be in focus anyway. So I think sharpness isn't as much of an issue as if I were using my 50 mil lens on a 1.8 aperture, for example, not as much of the center will be sharp, which is sometimes the effect that you want. Um, but yeah, I, I say that I usually, in the garden, I will use autofocus, but if I'm worried that it might put it the focus on the wrong part of the flower, then I'll switch to manual. Mm -hmm. And you use a fast enough shutter speed. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I don't tend to drop below 400 ISO. Uh, it, I, I get a bit scared of going higher than that because of the noise and my camera's mm -hmm. not dealing with the noise very well. But no, yeah, I just think, yeah, I, I always shoot manual. So I, I will always be adjusting my shutter speed and my aperture as I go along, which does help because if you're if you're thinking about how fast your shutter speed is, it means that you're less likely, I think, to have a blurred image. Okay, right. So we've got to the last few questions now, which usually means a few more come in. But the last few questions, <laughs> <laughs> a couple of people saying actually they have either a little plastic stool which extends, <clears throat> which can take your weight. Um, you can so you've got yeah. somewhere to sit when you're taking photos. Uh, another one, a mini stool and a garden knee kneeling pad. <coughs> Oh, yeah, they're good. Yes, definitely. Um, again, I wouldn't take them out necessarily, but I would um, use them in my own. I have a kneeling pad in my own garden. I'm thinking about investing in a shopping trolley, old lady style, to actually put all my camera equipment in when I go out and about. Um, so I, some of the professional garden photographers actually have golf buggies that they take around the gardens with all their stuff in but yeah I'm thinking maybe because it's all getting a bit heavy on my back yeah uh, have you ever used a Raynox lens no would like to but no okay uh another question about the Adobe website can you edit it after it's been published um yeah yes I do it all the time I update the text on it I take photos off put photos on yes definitely all the time and do you ever use a monopod um, I have one. I use it sometimes when I go to the Peak District, when I'm sort of travelling over um, the mountains and the hills. I haven't used it hugely, but yeah, sometimes. Okay. And in terms of uh, exposure mode, do you ever use aperture priority? Do you use shutter priority or manual? So when I started learning 15 years ago, I was an um, auto girl for a good few years, green auto. And I've still, I'm not going to be snobby about that. That can still get great results. I'm, you know, fully, if you want to use auto, use auto. Because it's, you. then you can focus all of your energy on what you're photographing. Then I went on to aperture priority. Um, and that was fine. And, but I, as I said at one point, I like things on the darker side sometimes. And I think that's really hard to do in aperture priority because it will brighten it all up. Whereas I don't want it bright necessarily. So then I learned how to use the shutter. So I, I put it on full manual so I can control shutter speed. So I can get it a little bit darker if I want to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Obviously you can use exposure compensation with aperture priority if, if you yeah, prefer. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I think the thing is that it just depends how your brain works, mm -hmm. you know, and how you see things. And sometimes it's just nicer to know, right, I've got the shutter speed I want. I've got the aperture yeah. I want. Yeah. We're off. 
Okay. Yeah. Right. Last question. Uh, you've mentioned using a diffuser. Do you ever use a reflector? Oh yes. Um, I do. I often take a piece of foil in my camera bag rather than because I only have a massive reflector, so it's quite bulky. So I'll often take a piece of foil and then if it's a smaller flower, I'll lay the foil on the floor to reflect the light upwards. That's really good. Um, <clears throat> I do mention that in the book, um, but I would I tend to use if I'm doing a portrait shoot, I'll take my big reflector because obviously they're so good for faces and to give catch lights in the eyes. Um, not so not hugely, but yes, because um, I always carry a, a piece of foil when I'm doing sort of low photo, flower photos. Okay. Uh, someone's asking what the difference is between a diffuser and a reflector. So a diffuser, question. the light comes through it, um, but it will block the harsh shadows created by sunlight. And a reflector is silver and shiny or gold and shiny. You can get gold ones um, and they will bounce. It's just like a mirror. It will bounce the light back um, onto the underside of the subject. And do you ever use lens hoods? Oh yes, I do. Um, I have my landscape lens that I mentioned earlier, the 24 mil has terrible flare. Um, and whilst I like flare sometimes, I'm not a huge fan. So I have a hood with that one. If I'm doing indoor photography, no. Um, and I don't think I know. Oh yeah, so the, on my bridge camera, the hood is there all the time permanently. And I think hoods in general, <laughs> I've dropped my camera a couple of times and the hood has taken the impact rather than the camera. So I think they're kind of, it's a bit like um, uh, neutral um, filters on, on the cameras. They can sometimes mm -hmm. absorb the impact if, if they do get a drop. But yeah, so I yeah. do use hoods. Yeah, like they're good at keeping raindrops off the front element. Yes, yes. Very handy for that. But a bit of a mixed blessing with macro photography. When you're trying to get close to a subject, you think, why, why is it moving away? And it's because your yes. lens hood is pushing the plant. So. Yes. <laughs> 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 okay well molly that's been absolutely brilliant and as i think somebody has just made an observation on facebook which i think is really nice that they will forever hear your voice now when they're reading your book which is really good <laughs> thank so, you <laughs> so thank you very much for talking to us tonight we've had lots and lots of people coming in saying thank you they've really really enjoyed it they're yeah. very inspired and uh, very excited to go out and try some more flower photography brilliant fantastic i've i've loved it thank you so much for inviting Great. me thank you you're very Thank welcome. Bye-bye. Enjoy the rest of your bye -bye. evening. Bye-bye.